Since the widespread adoption of the internet, the once controllable phenomenon of parasocial relationships have become inevitable, due to the constant presence of celebrity along with the inescapable fact of its unattainability. We're going to look at how these relationships develop, how they affect the people on either side, and the responsibilities that come along with having one, both for creators and their fans. Come along for the ride. Part 1. Parasocial Relationships a brief history. Parasocial relationships are as old as society. The term was first coined in reference to television and movie stars in 1956 by David Horton and Richard Wool. Simply put, it is the relationship formed between a celebrity and their audience. This can be with anyone from a radio host to an Instagram influencer, and is, at some level, an unescapable part of engaging with culture. Versions of these interactions have existed since before mass media even existed, but they became more widespread with the invention of television and the emergence of movie stars such as Charlie Chaplin. Parasocial relationships are, at their core, a power imbalance. For the sake of this video, let's refer to the two sides as a creator and a viewer. The creator is always the one letting the viewer in. Oftentimes they are putting on a character for the viewer. The viewer does not and cannot fully know the creator, but they know enough to feel close to the creators that they watch on a regular basis. The rise of the internet has only multiplied the intensity and frequency with which the average person is exposed to these relationships. There are arguments to be made, Everyone on social media occupies both sides of that relationship, but the ones with the most capital, followers, likes, views, whatever the metric is, are the ones with the most obvious power. Obviously, different platforms have different metrics for this, but across all of them is one constant. If you are making a living as a creator on the internet, you depend on a multitude of parasocial relationships. These can be more intense when the creators involved are streamers on platforms such as Twitch, as this type of content demands a more natural, less curated view into streamers' lives. Now, these relationships aren't always intentional, nor are they always positive or negative, but it is impossible to discuss them as a phenomenon without also discussing the significant danger they can present for minorities. Harassment campaigns and cancelling of creators are all symptoms of an extreme parasocial relationship that leads to a sense of ownership over and dependence on a creator. This can make it feel like a betrayal when the creator inevitably, as a human being, makes a mistake and is punished for it to a degree that it's often so far outside the realm of reasonable that people are being driven out of their careers for a bad take. Part 2. The Ballad of Lindsay Ellis Lindsay Ellis is a New York Times best-selling science fiction author and former video essayist. She began making content on the internet in 2008 after graduating from USC School of Cinematic Arts with an MFA straight into the financial recession. She started out under the Channel Awesome banner as the female version of Doug Walker's nostalgia critic, known as The Nostalgia Chick. She left that channel for a multitude of reasons, and began focusing on longer-form video essays. She played a major role in the development of BreadTube, and served as inspiration for such creators as ContraPoints and Sarah Zed. Over her career, she has been subjected to multiple harassment campaigns, most notably the White Genocide Incident, and a cancelling over a tweet comparing Raya and The Last Dragon to Avatar The Last Airbender. She talked about these both in separate videos, one an XOXO talk, and one a video essay uploaded to her main channel. The first led to her being institutionalized and significant harm to her marriage and other relationships. The second... In a statement posted to her Patreon, Ellis described 2021 as the worst year of her life. In the same statement, she reflected on the role of the internet in her life and described her career as a ghost, 
she ended the statement by announcing her retirement from YouTube. To restate that bluntly, Lindsay Ellis has been harassed to the point of leaving her career of 13 years for a tweet comparing Avatar The Last Airbender and Raya and The Last Dragon. Regardless of if you agree with the tweet or not, that's an insanely out of proportion consequence for 260 characters. This is an example of a parasocial relationship turning from the adoration of fans into a hate mob. The disproportionate vitriol of the hate she received can be blamed on several things, mob mentality, virtue signaling, but a large part of it, and the part most relevant to our topic today, is a sense of disappointment from her fans. They felt like they knew her, that she was a friend, and so when she betrayed the friendship, they reacted as they would to an actual friend betraying their trust. With disappointment, anger, even grief, and an expectation of an apology. The issue with this, of course, is that Lindsay Ellis does not know you. She has never met you, and never will. You are part of a faceless mass of users on Twitter.com who are attacking her for a nuanceless message that she put maybe five minutes of thought into. She owes you nothing, especially if you're not one of her patrons. Ellis posted a video about the incident and about cancel culture in general, which is heartbreaking at times, and an admirably thorough dissection of the pain that unchecked parasocial relationships can lead to. However, this isn't to say that all of those relationships are bad. Part 3. Healthy versus Unhealthy There are ways to have healthy parasocial relationships, and the easiest step towards this is just to be aware of the relationship. Keep it in your head that you don't know these creators, and vice versa. To them, you are one part of a faceless crowd that provides their income a very, very small and insignificant part. You know nothing about their lives beyond what they tell you, and you are not their friend. Healthy parasocial relationships are great and wonderful, but when it gets toxic... Twitch is a website owned by Amazon that has been active since 2011. Users on the site livestream everything from video games to their morning routine. It is many creators' full-time job and also is practically a breeding ground for toxic parasocial relationships. As I said earlier, the live format of Twitch lends itself to a more intense parasocial relationship as the creator is less able to control what the audience sees of their life. If something comes into frame while you're live, your audience is going to know. It's not like you can edit it out. As a result of this, creators are often subject to significantly more scrutiny and harassment than their peers on other platforms. In an article published by HuffPost, two women who use Twitch as a primary source of income spoke about the harassment they faced. One of them commented that her fans, and I quote, got really angry when they found out she had a boyfriend. End quote. With another describing streaming on Twitch as being like having millions of people be your boss and your boss is allowed to sexually harass you every day. Opening your personal life up to the internet is on some level an inescapable part of having a large presence on any platform, but there are lines that shouldn't be crossed. You're never going to be able to date your favorite Twitch streamer any more than you could date Bella Swan. Like with Lindsay Ellis, this leads to some streamers abandoning the platform altogether. Being a creator on the internet means inviting a type of scrutiny that the creator in that same HuffPost article described as being at the mercy of these people, which is just simply not sustainable in the long term. Part 4. David Tennant We've been talking a lot about parasocial relationships between content creators and their fans, but that's a very specific type of relationship. 
Creators don't need to directly engage with their audience for these relationships to develop. Purely existing in the public eye is enough. David Tennant is a Scottish actor known for his roles in Doctor Who, Casanova, and Jessica Jones on screen, as well as many different stage roles including several productions of Hamlet. He does talk shows and interviews on occasion, mainly while promoting shows and movies he's in, and has joined several Twitter watch-alongs for some episodes of Doctor Who over the COVID-19 pandemic. Aside from this, he has no social media. He doesn't know what the eggplant emoji means, and seems very happy with his wife, who is on social media, and their five children. He also has a very, very dedicated online fan base. This fandom is centered on Twitter, with a decent presence on Tumblr, and often revolves around his role as Crowley in Good Omens and his chemistry with his co-star Michael Sheen. Despite Tennant's relative absence from online spaces, he is still unable to escape the grasp the internet has on celebrities, he says. Clips and interviews from his shows go viral. People thirst after him daily on websites he has never seen. Some of this is just an expected part of choosing such a public career, but the internet has forever changed what being a celebrity means. You can no longer even hope to control the conversations people have about you on a public platform. Now, I don't know Tennant's personal feelings towards his fandom, but it is worth keeping in mind that on a certain level, he and all of your favorite content creators are all people, just like you, trying their best to exist under the same system you are. Tennant started acting in 1987. Since then, the way that culture has developed has made his chosen path a lot more scrutinized than he ever could have planned for. Part 5. I am inevitable. A common refrain in the discourse surrounding creators and parasocial relationships is, well, they chose this. And while on some level that is very true, they also didn't really have a choice. Sure, having a platform comes with a certain level of responsibility, but looking at creative people in more traditional industries, film, theater, television, is it fair to say that if they can't handle the responsibility, they shouldn't create at all? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But it's a question worth examining. From the other side of it, you also don't really choose to form parasocial relationships. Not in the same way that you choose to form friendships, anyway. In order to have a friend, you both need to make an effort to spend time around each other, to talk to each other, to care about each other, right? You can form a parasocial relationship without even realizing it. Watching one video can be all it takes, scrolling through someone's Twitter feed, suddenly... You're attached to that person. You don't know them, but you care about them. You can't avoid these relationships beyond, like, going off the grid entirely and not engaging with any form of media or celebrity, which, even if parasocial relationships were all bad, is something most people just aren't going to do. On some level, if you are on social media, you are a creator. Your followers are forming a parasocial relationship with you. If they don't know you in real life, the only connection they have with you is how you choose to portray yourself. They may only know the very performative aspect of you that gets put on the internet. That relationship isn't any more or less valid than your real life friendships, but it's an inescapable fact that you will have parasocial relationships. Hopefully, everyone watching this video at this point recognizes that this interaction is parasocial. It's not useful to try to avoid parasocial relationships entirely, and these relationships have improved many lives. I wouldn't have met many of my close friends if not for a level of fandom interaction that is mostly driven by a parasocial relationship. Despite this, both sides of a relationship have to be very aware of it, and from the creator's side, conscious of how they use it in order 
for it to be a healthy one. Part 6, The McElroys. Justin, Travis, and Griffin McElroy are brothers who have been making podcasts and other content on the internet since 2010. They host the Advice... Advice... Show, My Brother, My Brother, and Me, run the Dungeons & Dragons actual play podcast The Adventure Zone, along with their father Clint, and host various other podcasts and shows with their family members. They have a very dedicated fan base that, while less prominent than it used to be, is still quite active. The brothers run live shows for their advice show, where they take questions from the audience. Over the first few years that they did this, you could ask anything, and this led to some uncomfortably personal questions. These are hard to talk about in such a public way, and they're also not very good material for a podcast whose main purpose is comedy. Because of these issues, they instituted a no-bummers rule for live shows that has been adopted by most of their fandom as a whole. Overall, they have a very positive atmosphere, both in their fandom and their content, however, as inevitably happens, they too have been Twitter's villain of the day, so to speak. These range from valid criticism to accusations of racism and other bigotry due to how some of their characters on the Adventure Zone have been portrayed that I don't feel qualified to comment on, to people finding the middle brother, Travis, a little cringy. Side note. Uh, throughout this video, I have abstained from using any creator's first name so as to maintain some image of professionalism towards them, and so as to not seem overly personal. For this section, I, uh, I sort of have to abandon that, as, you know, they're all named McElroy. So, as a quick little reminder, I do not know Justin, Travis, Griffin, Clint, Sydney, Rachel, or Teresa McElroy. Neither do you, unless you do. Or unless you are them, in which case, hi. Why are you watching this? Okay, back to the segment. Travis is the member of the family who most frequently draws criticism for his actions. He is also, coincidentally, I'm sure, the only one who is openly mentally ill. This isn't to say that mental illness absolves everyone from bad behavior. It is a reason, not an excuse but rather to point out that if there is going to be an attack on part of a group, it is important to examine whether the behaviors being criticized are actually morally bad, or if they are simply, morally, harmless manifestations of someone's mental illness. In the case of Travis, eh, a bit of column A, a bit of column B, but I'm not here to relitigate that discourse. Uh, fuck the discourse. Social media is not conducive to a level of nuance that makes serious conversations on those platforms remotely useful. I am here to discuss the relationship that the McElroys have with their audience. The reason I brought up Travis specifically is that he did this... this thing in November 2020. If you're from the United States and were 18 or older on November 3rd of that year, Statistically, there is a two in three chance that you voted in the presidential election. Particularly for people in minority groups, it was a pretty scary night. Also, Destiel became canon. It was a truly insane experience. During this, Travis was tweeting through it, as so many of us were, but he was doing something a little different. Uh, he was tweeting things seeking to emotionally support his audience, stating that he would hold their hand through the dark times. To me, and incidentally, Bo Burnham, uh, this is a little irresponsible as a creator. You cannot offer emotional support to a faceless mass of people you don't know. I can't stare down this iPhone camera and speak comfort into your soul to heal all your problems. I don't know you. I don't understand what you're going through, and frankly, I don't want to. I have enough shit going on by myself, I cannot take on the emotional responsibility of caring for your problems too. No creator should. 
It breeds a type of intimacy that is impossible with a parasocial relationship. It invites your audience to come into your DMs and trauma dump, and you as a creator started that. The most emotionally healthy person in the world couldn't handle that level of emotional baggage, and let's face it, most creators are not the most mentally stable. Nearly all of the discourse that I see around parasocial relationships is very centered on an audience's responsibility to remain aware of that relationship, and while that is true, you do have a responsibility to keep healthy boundaries in mind when interacting with creators, it goes both ways. The creator has an equal and opposite responsibility to keep parasocial relationships in mind while making content. Part 7. Striving for Balance As I said earlier, parasocial relationships are not always bad. If both sides are aware and invested in upholding the boundaries that are inherent in that relationship, they are perfectly fine, maybe even normal. But the key part of that is both sides upholding it. It is all well and good if you as a viewer are aware that you don't know them and cannot have a truly personal relationship with them. But if the creator is constantly inviting you to... I don't know, text them with your mental health problems, reach out to them for help. This still erodes those boundaries in a way that cannot be healthy. Another side note, it is possible to turn a parasocial relationship into an interpersonal one. However, statistically it is nearly impossible and also a questionable choice in and of itself. So, possible has worked for me. Not likely. Not necessarily wise. Okay. Back to the thing. So. Where is the perfect balance? What is the equal and opposite reaction? It's hard to say. Both sides need to be aware of the general complexities of the relationship and how that affects them. Creators need to maintain and enforce strong boundaries and audience members need to respect those boundaries and keep a healthy distance between their attachment to a creator's work and public personality and any invented connection between you and the real them. Creators are not your friends. If anything, they are independent contractors and you are their clients. As Bo Burnham once put it, I'm in a service industry. I'm just overpaid. <laughs> <laughs>